You know, when you look at a piece of steel, it seems, well, simple, right? It's strong. It's everywhere. It's just metal. But if you could zoom in, I mean way, way down to the atomic level, you'd find this secret world that is just breathtakingly complex and beautiful. So today, we're going microscopic to uncover the hidden life of steel. And that right there is the whole point. We're not just looking at pretty pictures. As the great metallurgist Harry Badatia put it, these intricate patterns, these microstructures, they're a language. They tell the story of the steel's creation, its history, and its properties. And it's all based on some really cool fundamental science. So this brings us to the big question, right? How is it that an alloy made of pretty much just two simple things, iron and carbon, can create such an incredible diversity of structures inside? Well, the answer isn't really in the ingredients themselves, but in the journey they take. Okay, let's dive in. Our journey has to begin not at room temperature, but in the intense heat of a furnace. See, when you heat steel up way past about 900 degrees Celsius, all of that complexity we talked about just melts away into one single uniform state. This starting point has a name. It's called austenite. I want you to think of it as the universal parent phase, kind of like the hot primordial soup from which every other structure in steel is eventually born. It's just a simple, orderly crystal of iron with carbon atoms dissolved neatly inside. It's a blank canvas, ready to be painted. All right, and this is where it gets really, really interesting. As that austenite starts to cool down, it becomes unstable. The iron and carbon atoms, they have to rearrange themselves into a new, more stable structure. And the path they take from this moment on, well, that's going to define everything about the final piece of steel. And they basically face a choice. There are two totally different ways for these atoms to rearrange themselves, two competing mechanisms that lead to wildly different outcomes. We call them reconstructive and displacive transformations. OK, to really get this, let's use an analogy. Think about two ways to board a bus. The reconstructive path, that's like civilians getting on. You know, people move around individually, they find a seat, they take their time. It's slow, it's pretty orderly. But the displacive path, that's like soldiers boarding a bus. It's a single, coordinated, lightning-fast maneuver. Everybody shifts together instantly. It's fast, it's violent, and it creates a ton of strain. So let's follow that first path, the slow road. Let's imagine we're cooling our steel down very slowly, giving those civilian atoms all the time in the world to move around. This is that reconstructive path where new structures are built piece by piece. The very first thing that starts to form is often this stuff, a latriomorphic ferrite. It starts to grow right on the edges of the original austenite grains, kind of like crystals forming on the shores of a lake. And because it's a civilian transformation, it's not confined. It can actually grow right across those old grain boundaries. Now, as the steel keeps cooling slowly, another amazing structure appears. This one is called perlite. And perlite isn't a single substance at all. It's a team effort, this beautiful cooperative structure where two different phases, a soft one called ferrite and a really hard, brittle one called cementite, grow together in these alternating layers. But those layers you see under a microscope, they're actually a bit of an illusion, and they're hiding the true three-dimensional nature of the structure. So to really picture this, and this is going to sound a little weird, I want you to imagine a cabbage that's been plunged into a bucket of water. Stay with me here. In this analogy, the entire cabbage, with all of its interconnected leaves, is one single crystal of that hard cementite. And the water, filling in all the gaps around those leaves, that's one single crystal of the soft ferrite. So a colony of perlite isn't a stack of layers at all. It's one incredibly complex interwoven crystal made of two things. The lines we see are just what it looks like when you slice right through that cabbage. OK, so that's the slow, leisurely route. But what happens if we take that other path? What if we cool the steel so fast that the atoms have absolutely no time to diffuse? This is the fast lane, the military transformation, and it leads to something completely different. This is your classic blacksmith move, right? Heating a sword till it's glowing red hot and then shh, plunging it straight into water. That's called quenching. And what happens inside the steel in that split second is just pure, violent physics. The result is martensite. There's no time for anything to diffuse. So the entire crystal lattice of the austenite 
is just violently sheared into a new shape. All those carbon atoms get trapped right where they are, which creates this immense internal stress. And that, that stress is the whole secret. All that strain is what makes martensite incredibly hard and strong, but also really brittle, almost like glass. And just how violent are we talking? Well, it's so powerful that if you polish a piece of austenite perfectly flat and then let it transform, the formation of these martensite plates will physically distort the surface. It creates a relief that you can actually see and measure. It's just a testament to the colossal amount of energy being unleashed. So all structures formed by this military-style displacive mechanism, like martensite and a similar one called bainite, they all share some key features. They form as these thin little plates to try and minimize all that strain energy. And, unlike their civilian cousins, they're always trapped inside the original austenite grain where they grew. That disciplined movement of atoms just can't make it across the chaotic border of a grain boundary. Okay, so we've seen the two paths. Now let's put it all together. A metallurgist can actually look at a piece of steel under a microscope and by identifying these different structures can literally read its history. It's like microscopic forensics. So when a metallurgist sees a complex mixture like this, they can decode it piece by piece. They'll see some structures decorating the old grain boundaries and they'll say, aha, that's a lotromorphic ferrite, a clear sign of slow cooling then they might see a colony that's growing right across a boundary. Well, that has to be a reconstructive product, like perlite. Then they spot these dark, plate-like structures trapped inside a grain. That's bainite. And finally, some light etching hard plates. Yep, that's martensite, the telltale sign of a rapid quench at the end. And so in the end, what you're looking at is a permanent record. The final microstructure is a map that tells the complete story of the steel's thermal journey. Every time it was heated, Every time it was cooled, whether it was fast or slow, the secrets are all right there, just frozen in these beautiful, intricate patterns. It really changes how you look at the world, doesn't it? Every single steel beam in a skyscraper, every component in your car's engine, even a simple kitchen knife, has this hidden story locked inside its microstructure. A story of its own unique journey from fire to form. It makes you wonder, what other stories are hiding in plain sight? and all the materials that are all around us.